Hello and welcome everybody to yet another edition of uh, our journal club. Uh, this is third edition of our journal club and uh, this time there are very interesting article which are lined up and uh, very clinically relevant article which uh, we all would connect to. And uh, uh, Dr. Prafula and Jayesh has uh, uh, put up a lot of efforts to find out something which is uh, which is going to be very useful and which is going to be very relevant to our clinical practice. So Jayesh and Praful, over to you. Uh, let's have fun together. So good evening, everyone. So Dr. Ansu is with us. He'll be presenting both the articles for discussion today. And if time permits, then I'll have a short presentation just to just for the readers. So what exact actually we are discussing today about that. And then we can take questions from the panelists as well as the audiences. Uh, Ansu, I hope you are ready with your presentation. Yes, sir. I'm ready for my presentation. Yeah, you can start with your PPT. Good evening, one and all. Today we have uh, lined up two articles uh, for today's Journal Club. The first article is on the effect of Nettasudal 0.02% for the treatment of corneal edema in Fuchs dystrophy. And the second is the about the effect of hyperospolar eye drops for dynal corneal edema in advanced Fuchs uh, dystrophy patients. So Fuchs endothelial corneal dystrophy is an age-related disorder that affects the individuals, especially women older than 40 years of age. Eight different genetic loci have been found to co-segregate with FECD. The International Committee for Classification of Corneal Dystrophies have categorized these loci into uh, eight types in FECD. Apart from genetics, the most consistent risk factors are age and gender, smoking, exposure to UV light, diabetes, body weight, and BMI uh, do correlate with increasing uh, chances of severity with uh, fugue central dystrophy. So the pathomechanisms in FECD that were seen are uh, the alterations in DNA, the post-transcriptional byproducts of TCFO and DMPK genes, which tend to elevate the RNA toxicity in the cells. Uh, the suboptimal functioning of the channel and pump proteins, such as SLCA4A11, MCPs, uh, sodium potassium ATPases, and aquaparins. And also, uh, it is found that the increased endoplasmic reticulum stress elicits an unfolded protein response and ox oxidative stress, causing the DNA lesions in the endothelial cells. Moving on to the article. So the study was taken up so that a treatment that could bolster the coronal endothelium's ability to maintain appropriate coronal hydration and FECD, uh, and thereby to postpone or to prevent the need for a coronal transplant and to refine the preoperative imaging and refractive outcomes for these patients. Netosodal is a drug known as a DOC inhibitor because it inhibits the rope family of the small G protein kinases. The mechanism of action found is that it increases the aqueous outflow through the trabecular meshwork, activates the coronal endothelial cell migration, and possibly the proliferation of the endothelial cells. The study hypothesis taken up was uh, to find out whether the off-label use of Ropressa could reduce the coronal edema in patients with FECD. The patients were included between um, the time period of July 2019 and March 2020, and the follow-up was completed in June 2020. The study was approved by the Ethics Committee and informed written consent was obtained from all the patients. The method, uh, the study population included all um, Fuchs endothelial dystrophy patients of uh, any gender, racial, or ethnic origin, and at least of 18 years of age and above, and those who were able to uh, and willing to administer the study medication. The exclusion criteria involved uh, included those who had active uh, intraocular inflammation, corneal ulceration or conjunctivitis, or of any history of herpetic keratitis. If they had any known sensitivity to any of the ingredients in the study medication, if there was an abnormal eyelid function or a history of non-compliance with using the prescribed medication, or if there was a current or planned pregnancy uh, within the study duration or involvement uh, at the same time, in another RCT within 30 days prior to the enrollment in the study, basically any ocular or systemic condition that could uh, keep the patient at a significant risk, 
it could uh, if it would uh, confirm the study results or interfere significantly with the patient's participation in the study. The sample size taken for the study was uh, 29 patients, out of which 15 went for study uh, a study uh, group and 14 went under controls. The statistical power were, was uh, found to be a uh, sample size of 13 eyes per arm was taken uh, for 80% power, which was taken to detect the 70 microns between the group difference in central coronal thickness reduction, which assumed assuming a two-tailed alpha of 0 0.05 and a standard deviation of 60 microns. Six participants already had endothelial keratoplasty in one eye. 11 uh, wanted to schedule the endothelial keratoplasty in one eye between one and three months after enrollment. One patient had an amblyopic eye, so the contralateral eye was automatically designated as the study eye. In 11 patients out of 29, both eyes qualified for the study, so one eye was randomized as the study eye um, using the computer-generated randomization table. Subjects were allowed to use assigned medication in the fellow eye if it had not had a transplant. Subjects were also instructed to refrigerate the study drops and instill one drop in the study eye each evening for the study duration. So at each visit, that is at the baseline at one month and three months, the manifest uh, refraction and assessment of scotopic corrected distance visual equity was done using a Snellen chart. The slit time examination intraocular pressure measurement by Goldman stonometry was, under, was undertaken. Uh, the patients uh, were asked to complete a 15 item visual disability questionnaire, which was validated for use for patients with FECD, uh, anterior segment uh, optical coherence tomography, Schimflub imaging using Pentacam, coronal topography using TMS4, uh, and optical biometry lens star also was done. And at each examination, any adverse events experienced since the last examination was also studied. So it is a prospective randomized double mask placebo controlled clinical trial using a computer generated randomization table. Both the subject and the evaluators remain masked to this assigned uh, treatment. The confounding variable was that the patients uh, who had existing dry eye. The primary outcomes uh, seen uh, used to study was the change in the central coronal thickness from the baseline to one month and baseline to three months. The secondary outcomes studied were the changes in the corrected distance visual equity from baseline to three months and the changes in the FECD disability questionnaire score at one month. Exploratory outcomes included those uh, changes in the coronal surface asymmetry index assessed by the coronal topography and changes in the intraocular pressure from baseline to three months. So 29 subjects in all was enrolled for the study and out of which 15 patients had uh, were randomized to an atosotal uh, control, uh, group while 14 were uh, randomized to the placebo arm. And, uh, after uh, withdrawal of many patients due to either glare or personal reason or due to COVID, the completed study was done uh, in 11 patients out of 15 in the, uh, in the netosotal group and 11 patients out of 14 in the placebo group. And finally, for analysis, uh, 15 patients were analyzed for safety and 13 for efficacy in the netosotal group, while 14 were assessed for safety and 13 for efficacy in the placebo group. Between group differences at the pre-specified time points were assessed using the student t-test. The analysis was uh, two-tailed and conducted on an intention to treat basis. P-values less than 0 0.05 were considered significant. And the sensitivity analysis con consisted of examining the box plots to, to detect any outliers in the main, secondary, or exploratory outcomes, and repeating analysis without the outliers to determine whether or not this affected the findings. The data was analyzed using the statistical analysis software. So a significant improvement in the central coronal thickness was found in the results between the baseline in one month and between baseline in three months in the retosoral group. While um, the central coronal thickness did not change significantly between the baseline and one or three months in the placebo group. The corrected distance vision measured in a darkened room improved significantly in the study eyes assigned to netosotal. 
while those assigned to placebo had no significant changes in the CDVA between the baseline and three months. The disability questionnaire scores did not change significantly in either arm from baseline to one month. The coronal surface asymmetry index did not change significantly in any uh, either arm also. The mean intraocular pressure decreased by 2.2 millimeter, uh, millimeter mercury in the entosital arm versus 0.02 uh, millimeter in the placebo arm between the baseline and three months. The ocular side effects which were seen uh, in the, the netocytal arm versus the placebo, which were observed by SITLAM examination, showed that there were uh, six patients, that is around 40% of patients who had congenital hyperemia, and three patients, that is 20%, had coronal verticillata in the netocytal arm versus that in the placebo arm, which had only three patients having congenital hyperemia. The symptoms reported by the patients included redness and irritation, redness only, and glare. Uh, in the netocytal arm, while uh, the placebo arm patients experienced irritation and watering only. So the authors concluded that the netocytal um, eye drops, it caused a significant reduction of central corneal edema, and there was an improvement in the scotopic corrected distance vision between the base and three months. A proposed mechanism of action by which the netocytal um, may reduce the coronal edema in patients with fuchs dystrophy is through altering the tension of the endothelial cell to cell uh, junctions. They also said that uh, further studies were required to compare the vision in different lighting conditions uh, to find the uh, functional disability and also to find out the overall satisfaction with the usage of netocytal drops versus the other options that are available currently like, like endothelial keratoplasty. The authors were unsure of uh, the improvement uh, of using netocytal eye drops in uh, biometric uh, imaging. No significant changes were found in the surface uh, asymmetry index in both uh, um, arms. And this index was studied because it is known that epithelial edema associated with FECD can cause coronal surface irregularity, uh, which increases the topographic surface asymmetry index. The dry eye syndrome also in older patients uh, was a confounding factor. Only the vertical letter did not result in any visual functional changes, and uh, most of them resolved upon the discontinuation of the treatment. The side effects uh, of the drugs resulted in early withdrawal of one patient due to the aggravation of pre-existing epithelial bullae, causing a disabling glare, and a suspected non-compliance of a patient, another patient, um, assigned to the netocytal in the three-month study. The principal limitations of the study included uh, the relatively smaller size uh, of the samples, the modest loss to follow up associated with the COVID-19, the assessment of visual equity with a Snellen chart and not a ETDR, um, ETDR is charting, and the ocular side effects of the drugs. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Dr. Anshu. So uh, you nicely uh, reiterated most of the points from the article, what they have done, how they have done it, and what they concluded. So what is your interpretation of this study? So what do you take away when you read this study? Do you have any comments on the study design, the way it was conducted, the statistical analysis, and whether the conclusions are valid? That is one. And two, what do you take away from it as a doctor or as a cornea specialist for your patients with views? The methods uh, used in the study were satisfactory as it uh, did uh, comply to all of the proposed um, effects that it had uh, planned on uh, studying. Um, yes, sir. so there was a few effects as they said, because it was smaller size and um, also as mentioned, um, they did say that they wanted a few uh, studies required to compare the vision and different lighting conditions and functional disability. And yes, uh, yes. we are aware of what they say. Uh, yeah. I think Dr. Fogler wants to take a look at the difference in the pachymetry values. Could you go back to that table from your results? Because you just mentioned the effect size or how much was the effect of the drug and the placebo. Yes, sir.
Right. So we have a very, very um, distinguished panel here as experts. So they are basically the who's who of uh, endothelial corneal disease, as well as a very special guest expert, uh, Dr. Sen Gupta, who is not an expert on endothelial corneal disease, but can tell us a lot about how, uh, what his thoughts are on the study design and the stats, etc. So uh, uh, Dr. Fogla, you have some comments. I can see your uh, uh, comments in the text box. So if you could please unmute yourself and so that everyone could hear you. Basically, I uh, just wanted to know if the, if the vision was uh, checked at the same point of time during the day. Because uh, we know that in pukes, you can have fluctuations in vision between the morning and afternoon. So at, at pre-operative, it was seen in the morning half and then the follow-up if the patient has come later part of the day, that itself can result in improvement in vision. And when they did the pachymetry, the, the measurements on pachymetry, uh, how did, what, what technique was used to measure the pachymetry? Did they use uh, anterior segment OCT or the tomography or the ultrasound? Did they try to correlate the thickness between different devices if they corroborated the change in pachymetric measurement? Because sometimes variations can occur. And epithelial mapping would have been helpful as well. We know that sometimes when you have epithelial edema, the epithelium thickens. So if your netarsidil would have worked, we would have expected the epithelial thickness also to go down a little bit if the, if the resolution of the edema. Although the patients seem to have you know, some improvement in the vision, but that can be highly subjective. None of the other objective measurements showed a difference between the netarsidil and the placebo in terms of looking at the corneal asymmetry index. And, uh, and I think the central corneal thickness, especially looking at the posterior corneal curvature, the posterior elevation map on Pentacam, uh, I, I think they have described that as a parameter whereby you can look at the change because when you get increase in the corneal thickness, you get more changes in the posterior corneal curvature than the anterior. So you see, actually, you see a depression of the posterior cur curvature towards the anterior chamber. So that is something that can also that could also have been used to, uh, you know, differentiate between before and after. And they did did they look at the ratio between the central corneal <coughs> thickness because that is another parameter that people use to look for progression of fugues or you know resolution of uh, edema with the use of metallurgy. Right. So, uh, Dr. Anshu, could you quickly take two or three of those questions? Did they uh, mention at what time of day or whether that was consistently observed when they did the measurements? No, sir. For this study, they did not uh, measure according to the diurnal variation. They did not uh, use that as a criteria. That was one of have, the side effects. That was one of the limitations of the study as well. Have they specifically mentioned whether this pachymetry is taken from, I think they mentioned data DSOCT as well as shine yes. plugs. So which pachymetry values are mentioned here and did they try to correlate between the instruments? No, sir. The correlation between the instruments uh, was not uh, done. They have not mentioned exactly as to how they did the pachymetry as well. Right. And as he's rightly pointed out that a uh, lot of work has come up in recent years about the value of looking at the shine plug maps. I think from Dr. Sanjay Patel's group. So they had information available from the shine flag images, which they could have used about the parallel isopacks, about those islands at the posterior elevation. So I don't think any of that is part of the paper, is it? No, sir. Not part of the paper. So wh while you're here on the, on the statistics and the table part, could I bring in Dr. Sen Gupta for his comments on... Uh, the study design, how it was conducted, how the stats were presented, if you yeah. could. Yeah. So if uh, you can stop her screen share, I think I'll be able to. Yeah. All right. So I generally, you know, annotate on the PDF itself, and then I think yeah. that makes it a little bit easier. With, you know, uh, so like you've already said, I'm not an endothelial uh, disease expert. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, I'm a, a retinal pigment epithelial expert, if you want to call it that. It's right. epithelium, but, you know, statistics are sort of, you know, you would use uh, universally. So let's look at some of that. You know, so first thing is when you look at uh, the word pilot study in the, in the you know, title, it's going to be a small sample. You know, no questions asked because uh, 
uh, you know, when people are not able to do larger studies, and of course, there, there is not much uh, previous literature. So pilot study is, is good. But then it, you know, as soon as you see that it's going to be a small sample mm -hmm. and it's not to be taken home with, though you can build on it, but it's not to be taken home with. Uh, you know, when you look at the method section, it says 29 eyes. It's, a, it's an odd number. You know, when you have two groups, uh, you generally expect a, 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 an even number and that's how statistical software give it uh, to us. So that's a little bit, you know, of course, they have explained why all this happened. Uh, then, you know, when they say 29 subjects, you know, whenever we, all of us write papers, I think it's good to use the word participants instead of subjects nowadays, you know, a lot of things are changing and, you know, people sometimes take, uh, you know, sort of uh, note of that, the patient themselves. So it's good to use the word subjects. Then they say symptomatic fugue dystrophy. No, so this is again a little subjective, I think, overall. Some people with uh, thicker corneas may not really be always symptomatic. So uh, it's a subjective inclusion criteria, which I found out. It might have been better to take something like, you know, corneal thickness more than so-and-so or something like that. <clears throat> okay, then they talk about randomization in the method section. But, you know, despite being the abstract and abstract, <laughs> limitations it's always good to talk about randomization allocation and masking because these are three most important parts of any rct uh, again you know here that allocation is not clear when you go to the actual paper you know it but the method section in the abstract does not say if both eyes were taken if only one eye was taken or you know if one eye was given uh, the drug and the other was given placebo or whatever so that's not at all clear from the method section uh, you know coming from the uh, results point of view uh, you know, the endothelial counts are not given. I don't know whether it's difficult to look at endothelial counts when the cornea, when there is stromal edema. So that's uh, something that, you know, I, I guess you might discuss. I mean, what was the placebo is not given in the abstract. Though when you read the full text, mind you, 99% people don't read the full text. You know, so what was the placebo used? You know, here it was a vehicle uh, which was given by the manufacturer, but then that is not given. Coming to the outcome measures, you know, that is central corneal thickness, which is a continuous variable. It's, it is, you know, talked about, we are going to talk about in mean. So they say mean difference is minus 20 microns with 95% confidence interval of minus 32 to minus 9 microns. Uh, you know, so this mean difference is, is it exactly the difference between the change in one versus the other group? So when you look at the actual results, you will see that, that, uh, you know, it reduced from 590 to 568 microns. In the other group, it reduced just by two microns. You know, so I think that's where they are coming from, where 22 microns is in one and then 20 mi uh, and there is two microns change in the other group. So that difference is now 20 micron. Uh, however, you know, it's always good to use something called beta coefficients. So beta coefficients are derived from linear regressions and that they allow you these, uh, you know, these values, which are very similar, but they also help in adjustment of confounders. You know, say here, if you see you know, the basal baseline corneal thickness is more in, uh, in the placebo group, right, from beginning. So, you know, this mean difference using just the uh, arithmetic mean is probably not a good idea. Uh, so from a statistical point of view, it's good to see beta coefficients. Uh, you know, again, in the study procedures, they don't tell us exactly how the central corneal thickness was measured. It would always be a good, you know, because this is a study which is based on only that one parameter, isn't it? Everything else is, is a story around that, but that uh, it would have been good to measure it maybe three times in a day, especially at different time points, because we know that. Uh, you know, time is important. And then use either a mean of the three values or sometimes we can also use the three data points as separate, you know, separate points and we use something called the repeated measures analysis. So then, uh, you know, the way the thickness was measured, what instrument was used, I, I think Ranshu has already pointed out. And then, uh, you know, whether it was done multiple times in the day and all this has not been told. Uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, ARI Pharmaceuticals is the one which has actually sponsored the study, though they say that they have no role in uh, you know, they have no role in uh, any of the design or the conduct, but, you know, that's something that we should probably have in mind. When they say sample size calculation, they took a basis, you know, uh, the assumption was that there would be a 70 micron between group difference. That's a huge difference, isn't it? So you might say that may reduce by 20 or 30 microns or something like that, but 70 microns assumption is, is quite a large assumption. And then that is based on change from DMEC you know, where we know that uh, stromal edema is going to reduce. So I think that baseline assumption is what, uh, you know, uh, what uh, entails the sample size. So instead of 70, if you had taken 30 microns, we're leaving the standard deviation the same, you know, I've done some calculations. So the sample size comes out to be 63 in each group. So sort of the take home message for the audience is that, you know, the larger the difference you assume, the smaller the sample size. And the smaller the difference you assume, the larger the sample size. Uh, 
in this intention to treat i i don't think we have enough time but essentially what is done is you know if all patients are not followed up till if all patients are followed up uh, at the last time point and you have data for all patients we call it the per protocol analysis and uh, you know when there is not enough data for all patients at the last time point then you know what we do is we actually generate some values in the interim period where that patient has been lost uh, using some techniques uh, such as imputations and then you know you have actually a whole data set at the end so that is called intention to treat uh, uh, you know, again, this table one, I think Dr. Fogla was mentioning about this. You know, when you look at this, the central corneal thickness at baseline is 590 microns in nitrocidal and 611. So that is a 21 micron difference right at baseline, right? And then overall, of course, so this is, I mean, we don't know whether this is significantly different or not. It looks like nitrocidal had lesser uh, degree. I don't know whether fuchs dystrophy can have severities or something like that, but uh, looks like nitrocidal had uh, thinner corneas at baseline and placebo had greater corneas, but we don't have P values at all here. You know, so another column with P values would probably have been good. Uh, and then I think we've already discussed that, you know, the outcome where only central corneal thickness has been described, no other outcomes uh, such as, you know, surface uh, or topographic have not been described. And lastly, you know, the central corneal thickness, uh, what they should have really done is shown something called a box plot, which they actually talk about before, but they don't show us any a graphical representation of how these things were changing over time. And also a block spot with trends or a line diagram with 95% confidence intervals. Uh, you know, this is actually almost all of this is there in the next paper that we'll discuss. So you will get a good example of those. And uh, you know, before I leave quickly, I wanted to <laughs> sort of show you that, you know, one of the authors has uh, a financial interest with Sun Pharma in Mumbai. You know, that is something that just came quickly to my mind. So, you know, these are some of the statistical points I thought, you know, we can discuss. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent points. Uh, the other expert panelists, Dr. Basak, Dr. Sunita Charasya, any comments from you on the paper? Uh, yeah, thank you, Jesh. And I think very well presented and all points summarized really well. So I would just uh, like to uh, say a few things. One of the things is that uh, I think the author should be commended for the study because this came at a time point when we were dealing with the COVID and we were having shortage of corneas. And one issue was, is there any alternative way of managing? So I think uh, this uh, the study came at that point to answer, though there are several loopholes, I do understand that. But I think uh, the attempt to find and seek answer to this question seems to be quite relevant. And I sort of agree with Dr. Fogla, who made this point about what time point of the day, because this is really important to assess, because even when the patients are using netarsudil, for that matter, any rokinase inhibitor, even the pachymetry difference, all that can vary depending upon the time point when you make the assessment. Uh, that is one thing. So whether they are apart from the factor, one confounding factor being the condition per se, and one confounding factor being the use of medication per se, and when do you assess that? So there are two factors which will which will kind of you know have an implication on the corneal pachymetry. That is one thing. That apart, if you look at the table, you see that there's a difference in the pachymetry both in the placebo group and the netosterial group. Now this can also happen because of the use of preservative. Preservatives are known to reduce the corneal thickness. So what kind of preservative was there in the placebo and what kind of preservative is there in etacidil is important to know because this will have, again, a bearing. So we see that the reduction thickness is there in both the arms, but this is something which will be important to know what the placebo was. So whether the reduction pachymetry is only because of the, the, uh, the uh, preservative which was being used in the molecule. So these are a few things which I would want to add. Apart from that, yes, an important point which uh, Dr. Sain Gupta mentioned is about the EC endothelial cell density. Now, certainly one may not get the, uh, the endothelial morphology in the central part of the cornea, but quite often when you look at the peripheral part and do the specular imaging from the peripheral part, you would be able to image the cells in many cases. So that also gives an indirect bearing upon what the status of endothelium is. So this could have been probably added to the uh, points which have been assessed in the paper. So these are a few things which I would say uh, the paper is relevant in some points, but I mean, there could have been much more which could have been done in the study. And I think obviously one of the biggest limitations is the follow-up. Like even if you say there was an effect by using the molecule, was the effect long lasting and how long? So it's really a little short time period to assess the efficacy of a molecule. Right. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'll try to bring in Dr. Basak, who must be wondering why people go to all these difficulties to study drugs when they can so easily do endothelial keratoplasty, which he does in the thousands, literally. 
so to just cut through the jargon uh, what what after i read the paper and what i understand is that if you have a patient with fuchs who has a corneal thickness of somewhere around 600 microns and a visual acuity of somewhere from 612 maybe a little bit less than that and you use netosotil for 3 months uh, that patient will have a 20 maybe 25 micron decrease in the corneal thickness and the uh, visual acuity as measured in a dark room might improve by maybe a line or half a line uh, that is what i took away from the paper so for you as a clinician would you be able to fit this into your overall algorithm for management of fuchs in any way this drug based on this data Doctor, i think you're mute sir. one more question to this yes please Uh, is, i think sir may be able to answer that perfectly so yeah. if you go through the introduction part in addition to this uh, improvement in visual acuity what the authors they claim uh, because fuchs dystrophy is uh, and cataract they go side by side what they claim even if you achieve some decrease in corneal thickness that will help you to get a good biometry so right. if you are planning a complete procedure so it may improve the refractive outcome since sir does a lot of triple procedure right. i would like be sake we all expect to refract this if you Be there, but what's his experience on DMAC with cataract, and if reducing the corneal thickness by seventy micron is going to make any difference in refracting outcome? Uh, probably, probably no. So during the COVID pandemic, I have experienced. So I randomly I used lot of ripasudil drop that time, and you know that five six months prior there was no cornea, and just giving randomly. and i didn't have very good experience with the rather we have some epithelial toxicity or like that so uh, that way if i uh, have a choice like 20 micron thickness reduction or 25 micron reduction from 600 it doesn't make any sense in terms of patient disability point and also from visual acuity point so naturally the answer straight forward is surgery second point what uh, profile is saying, like again biometry part you know that uh, the 20 micron will not cause anything uh, and biometry changes but i have another concern here in this study is that what is the dosing schedule is once a day but if you read the full text of like rock inhibitor and the very good editorial by Shigeru Kineshuta and their group editorial invited. It is available to everyone, open access. The there is a big concern about that because it acts only for six hours. So most of the people used to give it for three times daily or maybe four times daily. Uh, so the question is, if one drop once a day, and when the all the reading is taken immediately after the putting the drop i do not i mean this is one of the lacuni i have found that if once a day how long it will uh, act on whatever mechanism they are acting on corneal endothelial cells so mostly we are using three or four times even the kinashuta article they say minimum at least two times daily so that is another concern is there so on the the, the big um, good point is that when they put this drop they are in more epithelial bully or more epithelial edema so they come to us and we advise surgery immediately right excellent take home points so dr himanshu dr parul uh, dr fogla again any other comments your personal experiences with this drug or what to take away from this data so a uh, few things i'll uh, so first and foremost uh, it's a, as sunita said it's a it's a good to do such kind of study and the reason is we all have been using at least ripasudil more than, uh, than the netasudil in many different different cases so here possibly for the study purpose they had to define a population and hence possibly fuchs uh, they you know, took but we all do use uh, in grafts in uh, post uh, cataract surgery corneal edema uh, post rejection post endothelial keratoplasties and many time we do have quite uh, interesting and exhilarating results so it's not that all the patients are doing bad many of them are doing really well 
many of them are not doing so well so we we really don't have much idea so it's nice to do such study where we have something somebody did a let's call it pilot or whatever but at least a thing has started and if you look at the references the references are anecdotal reports or like uh, one case two cases and such kind of thing so when somebody starts such kind of thing it's good to have a base there and we can sort of build upon that now coming to this study if i look at uh, the the paper not to criticize point of view but if we probably want to understand little more uh, from that like in uh, inclusion and exclusion first and foremost uh, any thing which you want to study where any outcome measures so any disease which you want to study in any study you have to define the disease right so unless you define it properly scientifically how was fuchs endothelial dystrophy diagnosed or how was it defined right and as uh, dr sen gupta was saying that the grades of course it's so important to probably distribute them in groups whether it was mild moderate or on what base they had uh, sort of divided the disease and so uh, selecting the cases randomly when they are just coming to the clinic would not be the possibly and when you say symptomatic it does not uh, mean same to everybody for me symptomatic may be glare in the night driving for you symptomatic may be loss of vision or somebody else it may be severe pain watering irritation we, we there's no uh, 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 it's there's no ambiguity there it's like quite uh, variable uh, perception for each individual so very important to define the disease and how it was diagnosed uh, also they said they were waiting for the endothelial transplant or they were already diagnosed fuchs so were they given any hyperosmotic agents or something they not mention that and if at all they were on anything was there a washout period given now think is about it if at all there is any change in the corneal thickness if at all because next article would possibly talk about it but if at all there is any change unless we give a washout period and if you start something then possibly you may have a confounding factor right up in there because really we are not sure about uh, what was the outcome of previous job then coming to the randomization and treatment regime part uh, we all discuss about like frequency that once a day probably they took it up from the glaucoma and probably they took it up from the previous study so uh, possibly they didn't want to carve out a, a new regime and then have other you know, ethical issues with them I, i don't know what they were planning but as dr basak said that uh, at least for ripasudil we we have experience that glaucoma people may use it once a day or twice but for cornea it has to be three times or if they can tolerate we can give given four times in fact there are few studies where they've given six times a day so is it something which they did not considered and by giving less amount possibly they missed out on a good outcome which could have uh, been there but well that needs to be answered uh, there uh, in the outcome measure uh, we all discuss about uh, the pentacam part interestingly they took pentacam in a diagnosis or, or what are the tests to be done but in analysis part there are no parameters which are discussed and the most beautiful part as as jayesh said sanjay patel and uh, the group showed center to peripheral ratio and in pentacam you can beautifully analyze in, in entire map and you can individual case you can see the difference what uh, we are getting rather than taking a mean and then uh, trying to subtract that from that thing so i, I really don't think that makes sense rather Uh, pairing them together i would say individual patient pre op post op should be analyzed and should be possibly uh, spoken about also i think dr sen gupta uh, touched upon that repeatability now any instrument would have repeatability issue so any instrument whichever we uh, take whenever we take any measurement there would be repeatability and if your measurement was within the difference was within the repeatability which is already studied or if not studied they should have studied so uh, without that it's it's just probably shooting in dark that assuming that yeah it's it's better or uh, uh, something and uh, rajesh uh, rightly pointed out that what time of the day they have done it has to be because that's the standard uh, diagnostic method of initial fugues when they are decompensating they have uh, diurnal variation they have fluctuating vision worse in the morning in the evening they get afternoon they get much better 
So what if when they get much better, that means there's the corneal uh, thickness change and there is uh, change in the edema. So if we are not considering that, well, we may, may miss out on a quite a large number of uh, changes which are occurring. Overall, well, very nice beginning, but I think we all can build upon this thing and have a little larger sample size and something which we are routinely using, like say repositorial, we can possibly study. Dr. Praful wants to show some uh, uh, data or a slide. While he puts that up, Dr. Parul, do you have any patients who you're managing with rock inhibitors and it's yeah. helpful? Yeah. So I, I, my personal experience in cases of FECD, I think I've not been very happy. But uh, patients where I've used in post-graft cases, post-DMEG, post dsec I think there it's been pretty uh, 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 good. But uh, per se in FECD, I think in my hands, uh, hypertonic saline uh, drops have also equally worked well. So uh, uh, yeah. I, have, I, I have also used ripasudil more than netvasudil. Uh, but I think uh, we still need more uh, studies and uh, more experience. I just want to show two slides that uh, combines the observation made by Dr. Basak and Dr. Ipansu. I'm not going to details of this. This is a, uh, basically a, this, is the, this is the article. This was published in 2021 in American Journal of Ophthalmology. The best part is they took all Doctor, almost 450. Yeah. Doctor, sorry, no. the slides are not being shared. Is it visible now? No. No. Uh, I'll just, I'll just stop share. share and share only the presentation which is open. Okay. This is an essential part of every Zoom meeting. Without <laughs> this, it doesn't happen. So. <laughs> So, okay, so I'll, I'll just uh, tell instead of showing no, the you, slide. Once you click on the share screen, you will find that your PowerPoint presentation is open. Just click on it and share. No, actually, it's going in my Zoom. I don't know what the issue. So I'll, re I'll, I'll stop sharing and again, I'll start re sharing that. I think that may work. Anybody is you uh, having experience with original uh, rokinase inhibitor in uh, like from J Japan Koa Pharmaceutical? Anyone in the panelist? No. I have used that one also. Uh, five, uh, a bit costly, but I have used them for my DUEC patient, DSO patient, and it worked. I mean. Uh, as long as you continue the drop and when you withdraw the drop, it again, the corneal edema. Ultimately, all the patients uh, were subjected to DMEC operation. So, sir, not from Japan, but we have a, a couple of doctors who, uh, from Gujarat, one of them, who got into making... I know, I know, I know, I know. And uh, yeah. we see a lot of those patients. So, I have started using... For most of my keratoplasty cases, if they have glaucoma, I use netarsudil as one of the anti-glaucoma medications. Yeah. And, and I think you, if you try and avoid any kind of, uh, you know, carbonic amylase inhibitor like yes, yes. And I, I, I feel that that really helps. It does bring down the pressure and maybe improves the health of the endothelium as well. But the other thing that I've seen in patients who have, who are waiting for surgery, if you put them on netarsudil, they don't get better, but somehow the, because of the epithelial little bit of fibrosis, the bullet, that painful bullet, they go away. They do get that honeycomb appearance, but the epithelium seems to be more stable. And the, the discomfort is only from the application of the drug. But once that stinging goes away, then they are comfortable. They don't have that ruptured bullet or so that may be another beneficial effect. And as rightly pointed out, both for most of the studies on DSO and DWEK, they have used drops ranging from three to six times a day. So once a day, I think it's a subclinical dosage. So, so uh, I hope this is visible now too. Yes, yes. 
So this is the article. It was a. It was possible. Probably it is the largest experimental study they have done. They took four fifty uh, desmet endothelial complex of FHD patient, and they checked for both genetic analysis as well as the protein uh, expression. So here, uh, what uh, Basak sir said, I just like to highlight that point. When they checked for all the concentration from ten micro to thirty, what they found that when you incubate the endothelial cell with thirty micromole of ribosidil. the effects are best so what they said this should be the ideal concentration possibly and uh, what they also evaluated that when you put one drop of ripasudil once a day the concentration that is reached is uh, around 10 micromoles and that stays for around 4 to 6 hours so what they recommend the minimum dosing should be at least 3 to 4 times a day and so that uh, this much concentration can be reached and that could have some effect so this is what dr himans went dr basak went telling ki od dose is not going to give you the best uh, results with uh, use of rocanase inhibitor and also they evaluated all the gene and uh, what they found that it has uh, rocanase inhibitor they have all positive uh, effect on endothelial cell and this is the image that i wanted to show you so to the uh, participant that see this is what they hypothesize if you are using only the rocanase inhibitor drops just like in the study it has to be early fcd cases where most of the endothelium cells are still functioning and the problem may be early uh, uh, dysfunction in the barrier function of the endothelial layer or the pump function however if it is a advanced case you have to combine that with your uh, either uh, dso or dvex uh, so that you can get that maximum effect of rocanase inhibitor so in this rct the cases that they took was uh, they had already stromal edema so it was very unlikely that netrasudil alone could have helped the patients so in that, if uh, your disease has already progressed then it, you have to combine it with the desmet stripping so this is what i wanted to highlight the second article is this one which dr basag highlighted it's basically an expert opinion by kinosita idal who has the uh, probably the best experience of uh, doing uh, this research on endothelial cells so this is a point which uh, i think most of us agree with that but i just wanted to put this picture what they have highlighted if your endothelial cells are in early stages of fcd whatever you do it's going to work if you are abnormal if you combine with rocanase inhibitor it's again going to work but in advanced cases even if you combine with the dvex or dso it's not going to work and this is what uh, the dilemmas they have highlighted which are uh, rightly highlighted the daily frequency and number of drops that you are going to use is still not standardized however they recommend at least three times a daily to four times a daily and if we corroborate that with the experimental study in ago i think probably three to four times should be the optimal dose and one important point they highlighted is in all the experimental study all the results are very convincing but the problem is that all these studies are done when there is no cell to cell uh, contact inhibition and the pathologically altered dm is not there so it may not be possible for clinical uh, result which are which may mimic exactly the experimental result and last point which i would like to highlight is this is what they highlighted when you give uh, ripasudil or netrasudil uh, what they found that no doubt they have effect on some genes uh, uh, which promote your uh, the endothelial cell from going to a uh, sleeping stage to a proliferating stage and they down regulate some inhibitor but there are some inhibitor on which rocanase inhibitor they don't work so this is what they say ki we may need some uh, may, you may have to combine rocanase inhibitors with some other drugs that may give us better result which is a uh, yeah, thing of i think uh, future studies so uh -huh. this too i wanted to highlight very nice Thank you so much, Dr. Praful. Uh, Dr. Nice. Anshu, are you still around? Uh, it is Friday evening, and the weekend is looming, so one has to ask if she is around. Yes, she is. Right. So I, I think if everyone has the stamina, we'll go ahead and quickly discuss a brief, uh, briefly the next article. We won't go into all the details as we did with this one, but if you're ready, you may proceed. Okay. 
So the second article is on the effects of hyperosmolar eye drops on the dinal coronal edema in advanced cases of fugue endothelial dystrophy. So the proposed measure of action for hyperosmolar drop is actually then increase in the epithelial surface osmolarity, resulting in an anterior corneal thinning and drainage of the corneal stroma. And uh, many experimental uh, studies had shown that uh, there has also been a posterior stromal increase also. But uh, these studies which were done in humans were not uh, conclusive. They were small, they were uncontrolled and not randomized. And so did not, and also did not account for the diurnal variation of corneal edema. So the study was undertaken. The primary endpoint of this study was the corneal thickness reduction one hour after the eye opening and hyperosmolar eye drop application, which was assessed using the shine plug uh, imaging. Secondary endpoints were the effects on the visual function, high contrast visual equity, disability glare, corneal thickness, corneal backscatter, and adverse events uh, over the duration of the study. If I may interrupt you, yeah. Uh, were you moving the slides or were you just seeing the... No, sir. I, I okay, was... right, right, Sorry. fine. Then go ahead, please. I thought you were not seeing your slides, so... Right. Okay, So, uh, the, the study uh, went as follows. So, the day before the DMEC operation, all the baseline exams were conducted at least four hours after awakening. The best corrective visual equity was conducted at least, uh, uh, was uh, conducted using the ETDRS charts. Um, the disability glare was assessed as forward scatter using C quant. The shine flux imaging to, uh, was done to determine the coronal thickness, uh, central coronal thickness, the coronal shapes, the tomographic signs of edema, and backscatter. And then to assess the Fuchs dystrophy specific patient reported uh, visual disability, the participants were also asked to complete the validated German version of the visual function and coronal health status instrument. And then the next day, directly upon awakening the hospital, the shine flux imaging was done at 0, 30, 60, 90, 120, 180, and 240 minutes. The visual equity uh, was assessed at baseline and also at uh, 120 and 240 minutes. The subjective visual function also was assessed where the participants rated the visual equity at every um, measurement um, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being the best. After the first and second measurements, each of the participants' uh, eyes received the allocated eye drop. The investigator applied the eye drops and occluded the nasal lacrimal duct for a few seconds to prevent the participant from tasting the difference in the osmolarity of the two uh, drops. The statistical power of the study was found to be 34 eyes per arm. So, so here finally, um, 148 patients were enrolled for study, out of which 78 patients were excluded due to various uh, reasons as to whether they declined to participate or another indication uh, other than Fuchs uh, dystrophy or coronal pathology was found or patients on topical glaucomasteroid eye drops, patients who used hyperosmolar eye drops in the last few days, any systemic diseases which was known to cause the uh, affect the cornea, and even patients who didn't have any uh, who had a problem with fixation during the baseline shine flux imaging also were excluded. So uh, after that, um, seventy participants were found uh, to be available, where they randomized uh, one eye of each of these participants to treatment using hyperosmolar eye drops, and another eye to control using a preservative-free lubricating eye drop. In both of these patients, um, one patient dropped out of the study after the baseline exam before receiving any treatment, and one participant dropped out of receiving the first eye drops itself, which resulted in participation of 68 patients, um, out, of, uh, after, out of which uh, patients who had a previous DMEC in that particular eye uh, were excluded and in the treatment uh, um, and patients who had previous DMEC in that in that particular um, eye, and those who had an insufficient shine plug imaging quality also was uh, excluded in the um, placebo arm. And finally, 59 eyes were analyzed in the treatment arm, while 55 eyes were analyzed in the placebo arm. So as results, uh, one hour after opening, uh, eye opening and application of the treatment or the placebo, the mean additional coronal edema was found to be reduced by 10.5 microns in the treatment arm and by 11.2 microns in the placebo arm. So which gives us a difference of 0.7 microns, which indicates actually uh, that there is no statistically significant or clinically relevant effect of the hyperosmal eye drops on the early morning associated coronal edema resolution. 
The secondary endpoints evaluated uh, the treatment effects of coronal edema and backscatter, as well as a posterior coronal depression. So the coronal thickness did reduce by 24 microns in the treatment arm and by 25 by 9 microns in the placebo arm. The posterior coronal uh, depression dissolved and was less negative by plus 3.7 microns in the um, treatment arm and by plus 3.9 microns in the placebo arm. Coming to the visual function, um, the mean gain in the high contrast visual equity was plus 1.4 ETDRS uh, letters in the treatment arm, while it was plus 2.2 ETDRS letters in the placebo arm. The disability glare decreased over the first four hours after eye opening without a difference in both between the treatment and placebo. And in contrast, the um, subjective visual function was a less rapid increase in the treatment arm as that compared to the placebo arm. Now, this graph shows us uh, how the resolution of coronal edema took place over four hours in these eyes, which were randomized to both the hyprosmolar or the placebo arms. The table on adverse events uh, showed us that uh, 30 eyes, uh, adverse, uh, 30 adverse effects were found in, in the eyes that were randomized to the treatment arm, while only one adverse effect was found in the eyes that was uh, randomized to the placebo arm. Uh, the types of adverse events uh, seen were sensation of burning, dryness, blurriness, and conjunctival uh, redness. But uh, all of these adverse events were found to be of mild to moderate severity, and they lasted less than five minutes. And um, so the authors did conclude that uh, the hyperosmolar eye drops did not accelerate uh, the edema resolution and no clinically relevant effect was seen on the high contrast visual equity or disability glare. There was a slower subjective visual equity seen in uh, using hyperosmolar eye drops and there were more adverse effects also seen using the same. The adverse events uh, of burning or blurriness, which was mostly reported by the uh, patients, were more of mild and temporarily though. Also, the full amount of the additional coronal edema did resolve regardless of the intervention, which is also seen uh, and studied in other non-randomized trials. Thank you. So right. What was the frequency of uh, uh, the installation of uh, hyperosmotic uh, drops? And so, uh, what was yes, the frequency? Uh, yeah. So, uh, one drop, sir. One drop was put in a day. Uh, no, was it? Was it one drop a day only? No, no, no. And so please read check. It's I think they uh, put it two drops in the early morning hours. Yeah, something like that. So yeah, put two drops just... only, and in the morning hour only on all the patient. And they evaluated all the investments are in morning hours only. So, mm. but in the discussion, what they extrapolated that if two drops are causing so much uh, adverse effect, events, so there is no point of trying four times a day. If you would have given four times also, the effect would have been same. So this is what the authors claim. So I the, think the whole, night whole, drops. one point I would like to bring out here is uh, the whole premise of study itself is wrong, I think. Because we know that the hyperosmolar drops that you put are basically for resolution of epithelial edema. I don't think it has the potential to reduce uh, stromal thickness or resolve stromal edema by any means. So we don't use it for visual improvement, but majority of the times in our clinical practice, it is used for resolution of the epithelial edema and the patient's irritation or from the bullet yeah. in your yeah. I don't think that uh, sometimes, yes, if you have microcystic edema, the epithelial edema can go away, patient may be able to see better. Or the spontaneous improvement in vision, what they see when they get up by afternoon, the vision getting better. If you apply a few hyperosmotic drops in the morning, it can accelerate the visual uh, improvement rather than waiting for a spontaneous improvement in the afternoon. But I don't think that uh, I have ever used uh, uh, hyperosmotic uh, hypertonic saline to try and reduce the corneal thickness. So one interesting thing is uh, that uh, the study design is very nice. I mean, if you look at uh, 
very impeccable design in terms of uh, all mm. the things whatever they've done i wish the same design was there in the previous uh, study i mean it could have been yeah. really nice the only thing here they uh, in previous study they did not define the, the disease here they defined the disease but they selected something which was uh, uh, i think more severe uh, 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 fukes and uh, already quite decompensated eye so had they seen in a earlier case or milder case possibly we could have seen little more changes where something is totally decompensated we do not expect much change also we have to look at uh, something like ocular surface resident time of a drop uh, even the lubricant drop with higher viscosity uh, if you uh, look at uh, some of the studies uh, by anthony brown's group and they had studied that the half life of uh, uh, of a you know, two percent uh, sodium hyaluronate was seven and a half minute half life and i'm talking about uh, so uh, possibly full life which does not uh, account to double of that thing but even if we do that you're talking talking about 15 minutes so a, a viscous agent also does not stay longer on the surface of the eye where a low viscous agent like sodium chloride would not stay any longer on the surface to uh, lead to as rajesh was saying stromal detergents it does it, it we cannot expect from uh, that uh, and uh, once or twice a day uh, um, uh, with such poor ocular surface resident time uh, i really don't think we can expect any miracle in those kind of advanced uh, fuchs cases so nice design but wish they had done in cases which are milder and possibly a little longer duration of the application. And uh, so if we are intending to prove that this thing would not uh, work, then possibly we would select this kind of uh, case scenario. But if you want to see that whether it works or not, then I think we should include all the, uh, the severity of the disease. I think the same your, uh, uh, yeah. your comments on the design the box plots you were telling us about any other comments you want to make the first thing i had the doubt was that you know they say that all patients who are a crack must grade uh, four and worse i think but then they say that you know, all patients had only stromal edema and no epithelial edema is that compatible with how the crash grades go i'm not really sure because you know when they are needing epithelial transplant that means you know most of them should have epithelial edema but you know uh, if i can sh quickly sh I think somebody else is sharing, so I'm not able to share that. Dr. Anshu, yeah. could you stop sharing? Yeah. Yeah. So here they say all eyes had stomal edema, none had epithelial edema in the results. But then, uh, you know, if so I'm not really sure exactly which patient they're talking about and how the inclusion and exclusion went. But, you know, that's from a purely clinical point of view. Uh, you know, there are some other very good points in the study design. I think Dr. Himanshu has already told us. Uh, uh, a couple of things I would just quickly say, you know, they see, they use the word participants <laughs> when they say modified crash mask grade four were used, you know, these are all inclusion criteria requiring endothelial keratoplasty. So I would imagine that most of them would have epithelial edema, but then, uh, you know, when they categorically say none had epithelial edema or stromal edema, it's a little bit confusing. And, you know, why the rationale, so like Dr. Fogla was saying, I had, I don't understand much about epithelium and stroma and edemas, but, you know, when they have so much of edema, I would expect them to have edema all over, but then. Edema, yeah, that is grade five. I have just opened up the crash grading in front of me. All right. Yeah. So then greater than or equal to, so, you know, then that means all of them are grade four, right? I mean. Yeah. Yes. All right. Then, uh, uh, you know, one good thing, another thing, you know, like I said in the previous uh, study, they did not show. P values here, you know, what they do is they, the table like two say the efficacy of hyperosmal or eye drops after eye opening. You know, so they say treatment and they say placebo, but they also give us the difference. You know, the, the, there is no P value, but here the difference is there. And when you see, you know, the corneal thickness, it's only 0 0.7 uh, microns. It's like minimum. But then, you know, what is more important is the looking at the 95% confidence interval. So here, if you see, it says minus 2 to 3.5. Now, this confidence interval crosses zero on either side, right? Some patients had minus two microns lower, while some patients had 3.5 microns higher. When that is the case, it can never be statistically significant, right? So here, if you see all of these 95% confidence interval, all of them are crossing zero. One is a minus and one is a plus. When you're looking at a continuous variable like this, which is um, you know, it's a thickness or 
uh, you know, all of these are thicknesses or log mar units and others. Uh, you know, when you see 95% confidence interval, which is on either side of zero, it can never be statistically significant. So that is sort of a, a quick take home message, except for subject visual function, you know, which does not cross zero. So this is the only one which is statistically significant, though there are no p values and there are none even in the text, but still, you know, this is statistically significant. And here, if you see this plus sign says increase is better, right? So the placebo group actually had better subject to visual function. That's of course, because of this adverse effect. So adverse effects seem to be definitely playing a role in terms of, you know, worsening that uh, situation for the patient uh, while not giving any, uh, you know, any uh, uh, sort of therapeutic effect. So at least from this study that it looks like, you know, and uh, this is the box plot that I was talking about, which the previous study should have given, uh, you know, so this is not exactly a bo box plot. This says these are means with 95% confidence, confidence intervals. So, you know, these are, so if, as you can see, the trend is slightly reducing uh, through time. Uh, you know, so these are called forest plots, F or double -R -E -S -T, where you use mean with 95% confidence interval. Uh, box plots give median with uh, interquartile range and some other things, some outliers. So that perhaps would have been a better plot to use, but you know this is still fair enough. So overall, it's a well-designed, well-presented study, but uh, you know the basis for uh, doing it and uh, you know how the inclusions went and all is a little bit uh, suspicious. I mean, it was a little bit suspect, though I was not really sure. Thank you. The authors, if you go through the discussion part. They have highlighted this. In fact, they say the result of the study should be considered in light of the exact intervention delivered and of participants included. And again, they re-emphasize this, that although the study cannot provide direct empirical data about the treatment effects for patients with earlier or later disease stages that included in this trial. So they themselves agree that uh, this hypersol drop, they may be useful in advanced disease or maybe earlier disease. But the stage that they took, the patient with diurnal edema only, in this particular stage, probably it has no impact. And they accept that this may not be, you cannot extrapolate this to the entire disease spectrum of uh, FECD. You know, but then most people read the abstract. Nobody really goes. Uh, that's true. And the abstract, uh, you know, when you take home an abstract. On face value, it suggests that hypersol drops have no value in FECD, which is, I think, wrong, which Dr. Foglas had rightly highlighted. If epithelial edema is there, it is definitely useful. Clinically, I think what we can get out of it is that uh, many times, uh, many of us like to use uh, uh, hypersol for psychological purpose in those bad stromal edema. When somebody has uh, decompensated cornea post cataract and give hypersol loads and as hope that that uh, will sort of draw out the water from stroma. <laughs> and so possibly for them, that article shows that maybe that yeah. may not be the case. But uh, yeah. as Praful said, they're not talking about the cases with epithelial edema. They're just showing us the mirror that all those cases don't expect much. Yeah. Yeah. I can understand why Dr. Fogla is so aghast why they use stromal edema as the outcome measure for hypersol. But unfortunately, it seems that a majority, because this is a cornea audience and cornea specialist, that's why we are all discussing this. But I think in the real world scenario, a lot of ophthalmologists seem to think that it will reduce stromal edema and they keep hoping and hoping forever. So maybe from that point of view, it's a good study to show them if they want to see it, of course. So I think that was the point of the authors. Yeah. Mm. Any comments? Any before we close from oh, any of the expert panelists? Yes, Dr. Uh, Basak, anyone else? No. Right. Pharma companies should come out with some topical glycerin drops. Yes. And that would be innovative. Mm. I, I, I had a patient from Punjab with corneal edema with the Daljit Singh lens. And I spoke to him at length and I told him, we can do a surgery and improve your vision. So he asked me, for what do I need to improve the vision? I'm so old. I only need vision when I have to sign checks. He says, I have these drops. He showed me these glycerin drops. He says, I just put it in my eye. And after two minutes, my vision is sufficiently clear for me to see what I'm signing. After that, he says, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> But those drops are useful. I, I know of surgeons who use uh, topical glycerin drop when they are doing endothelial keratoplasty as well because it helps them visualize the details of the anterior chamber. In wet lab, when we do training for uh, these corneal surgeries, when we train people, we have these old cornea, discarded corneas from the eye bank. 
we just put some glycerin on top and within within few minutes the cornea becomes absolutely clear it looks nice and compact so i think it would be nice for one of our indian pharma companies to explore and try and come out with units or something like that with glycerin which are which can be used you know in certain situations where you want for decision making for patient with corneal edema you want to have a quick look at the fundus and see whether the optic nerve status is good or bad so that you can give a prognosis to the patient as to what would be the outcome or intraoperatively if you are doing a combined surgery rather than say first i will do the corneal surgery and later on come back maybe it will improve the safety of doing a combined surgery when you are removing the cataract or trying to do a secondary iol fixation so this is something i think we we should encourage one of our pharma company maybe yeah. Ford can look at it and come out there they have a very wide range uh, maybe a word with nikhil or something if we speak to him uh, that would work that will definitely reduce stromal edema that much i can say hyposol will not mm. hyposol is only in the level of epithelium that's a fantastic suggestion combining both articles if you look at that second article has wonderful design so putting it in with the first article changing few things what they had missed out on the frequency and all those things combining uh, the hypersol along with that to treat those epithelial edema and those thing which we sometime get uh, with uh, rocanes inhibitor well if you combine both articles we have something very interesting well, this is an incentive for to for us to do another study you know yeah you have few expression in india to try and see if somebody can provide the funds or you can get a grant and do a study where patients get some incentive for coming back for follow up otherwise what do the patients get for staying half a day in the hospital getting all these various tests done and coming back for follow up as when you tell them so i think something needs to be done and i think it should be nice and if we can prove that there is some role of rocanase inhibitor that would be good we can kind of streamline the way the drug is used otherwise it's most likely to be misused because a lot of people think that they just hear about rocanase and everybody is just prescribing the patient some of them maybe they are naturally getting better with the steroid but the attribution goes to the rocanase inhibitor that oh because you are using this and some of them they deteriorate they come to us faster because the edema gets worse and then they need surgery earlier so i think uh, maybe at aims or any other places where they have a good volume of fuke patient uh, you can you can pick out the fallacies in the previous studies and have a better study design and then try to improvise and you know uh, come out this this wouldn't take too long like they can do a study in 3 months i'm pretty sure one of your postgraduates or something can take it up as a thesis subject and you know work on it and that would be great it would benefit a lot of us we are working on it actually but it's not fcd cases we what we are looking into it in early cases of uh, post cataract surgery edema this is what we are doing so if uh, uh, including ro kinase inhibitor because if you go through that uh, expert article by kinositaita well, that means you are you are you are doing in cases where you are sure that there are healthy endothelial cells because yes. it looks besides looking at the extent of gutte there is no way of figuring out whether your peripheral endothelial cells are healthy or they are diseased that's why you get in dso you get fast and slow responders that could be the difference between the two groups in the sense that the ones who have healthy endothelial cells in the periphery they respond faster and their edema resolves whereas the one who have unhealthy endothelial cells either they take longer or they finally end up with a edema it don't work this what the, and, that and dr basak has seen recurrence of gutte after doing a yeah uh, yes, so yes. he has seen that so that indicates that by the time these cells migrate from the periphery to the center they go from normal to abnormal and they start see showing the formation of gutte yeah uh, dr fogla i just wanted to add something uh, to all this so uh, personally like i have also tried to use uh, uh, the ro kinase inhibitors and this was also again during the pandemic times when patients could not undergo transplants so uh, like if we have to plan a study i personally feel like uh, the fuchs endothelial dystrophy is not a great model to study simply because there are too many variables in that Uh, one of the important components as you rightly pointed out in your remark was about the intraocular pressure i think there's a really great delicate balance of intraocular pressure stromal hydration and epithelial bullying because strom- a patient may have stromal edema but will not have you know epithelial bullying a patient may have epithelial bullying may not have stromal edema so these are things which are quite variable and are depend upon the intraocular pressure which 
I think uh, the exact interaction is a little hard to understand. So, what and especially if your endothelial barrier is not working, then pressure will have a much greater role to play as compared to an eye with with an intact endothelial barrier, which regulates the flow of fluid that goes into the anterior chamber uh, into yeah. the cornea. Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, what Praful is saying, like looking into the cases of pseudo corneal edema and like, let's say the cases which have got uh, sectoral edema. I actually did that study and uh, though I did not publish it, but I'm just sharing my results. So what I found was that like, uh, obviously, like when you have sectoral edema and when you start the row kinase inhibitors, what I see that there is an improvement and that also partly could be related to the, uh, you know, other medications which you're using alongside. But overall, the endothelial cell density certainly does not change much. It's probably just probably some effect on the functionality and reducing the apoptosis. There's no actual proliferation what you see. But however, contrary, I think we should also look at those cases of graph rejection where we are starting. So uh, in some patients, when you start this medication, you see there's an increase in cell density. Now, whether it is happening because of migration from the peripheral cells, that does not happen with cases which have got a endothelial pathology in the recipient bed. Like let's say cases of keratoconus where the endothelium is healthy. So uh, we can, I mean, I, I do, don't say there's a great number, but if we can pool and we can look into it, uh, we do see an increase in cell density gradually with time simply because of migration, which happens from the peripheral healthy bed to the central part of the graph. So I think this is something which probably all of us can look at and share our experience in the next edition of uh, <laughs> row kinase no, inhibitors. Row kinase inhibitors have become part of the regime for post-rejection episodes as well. So if I see a patient with a rejection, I treat with steroids and control the rejection, but then I put them on a row kinase inhibitor with the belief that maybe the surviving cells which are there they will survive better and might migrate to the area where the cells are non-functioning. So, uh, I think so what, medicine, what dose do you three times, Rajesh? Yeah, I, I give them three times. If they don't tolerate, I ask them to use it twice a day. Twice a day. And please them before. Because please. that's the glaucoma. It works for the glaucoma as well. So, yeah, which is twice a day. So, I tell them thrice a day. If they don't tolerate it, I tell them that's to make it twice. Is. So I think one, one thing we have discussed many times earlier also, that many times such kind of thing where the individual person may not have huge number, uh, as a society, I think we can collaborate and collect the number together and we can have a common publication under the name of society. And uh, I mean, it, there are so many things where individually, if you pick up uh, total number, would be mind boggling compared to anywhere in the world. So uh, if we as a society have more collaboration on such kind of thing where smaller numbers can be put together with a uh, total big number, it would be really wonderful. Yes. Right. right. So, uh, I can see that the number of participants is dwindling. So, it's a sure sign that we must wind up the show when the audience has started to leave. So thank you very much, uh, very much, everyone. We had a great discussion, especially the expert panelists, also Dr. Anshu John for putting in the efforts to present. And uh, have a great weekend, everyone, and look forward to the next edition of the Journal Club. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.